delighted today to welcome you and to have you in London. We are on Fitzroy Square, where Tristan Hoare, who is the um, the owner of uh, the Tristan Hoare Gallery, is welcoming us. He's actually standing outside the gallery right now on Fitzroy Square, which is one of the most beautiful squares in London. It's a very special place. Tristan, thank you so much for welcoming us and having us. It's, uh, it's really wonderful to be with you. Well, it's a great pleasure and a great pleasure to welcome uh, all of you from so far away into, uh, uh, well, Fitzroy Square um, and also the gallery. So thank you for having me. Um, Absolutely. I'm going to give you a, a uh, a little tour of Duffy the Square, the building, and this fabulous exhibition we have of Kauri, uh, whose um, ceramics we have up at the moment. And in the course of that, um, we'll explain a little bit about, about the gallery. Um, essentially, I've been open for about 10 years. Um, and I say it's definitely a, it's quite an intuitive process. I started with photography about 10 years ago on the basis that it was something that, that my friends would understand and, and I had quite easy access to. And over the course of um, the last 10 years, um, it's adapted and changed. And I, and I, I now work with maybe uh, 12 to 15 artists very regularly who are from all over the world, all different ages, kind of using everything from textiles, ceramics, uh, glasswork, painting, drawing. Uh, uh, and I find through every exhibition effectively, um, I'm the lucky one because I end up learning the most about uh, different mediums as, as Firstly, the experience of working with the artist is very informative. And um, the other thing is that people come in who know a lot about things and tell me. So I can then seem very knowledgeable when the next person uh, comes in. Um, and that's one of the things that I like about the gallery and I keep light on my feet so that I can keep learning and moving on to different artists and exhibitions. Um, so uh, I'd just like to start uh, um, with, uh, to show our provenance here in, uh, uh, in Fitzroy Square. By, with the blue plaque, of which there are many in Fitzroy Square, of Charles Eastlake, who's the painter, first uh, 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 director of the National Gallery. Um, and there are, in fact, a lot of interesting people that have lived and do live on the square. Uh, it's a Robert Adam designed square from the 19, sorry, 1780s or 90s, the last fully standing one in London. And um, in the house next door lives Tracy Emin, uh, as well as lots of maybe a few famous uh, English comedians, uh, writers. Um, it's a place that's been inhabited by artists for the last few hundred years. And I feel that I'm one of the latest uh, on the block, having only been here for the last five years. Um, I'm now going to take you on a very gentle stroll uh, um, uh, down the road. That green awning you can see is going to be Tracy Emin's house uh, and into number six Fitzroy Square. Um, and as I said, it, it's a Georgian building uh, um, dating from about 1780s. Um, and you'll just see that the proportions and the feel of the building are absolutely marvelous. And it's therefore not your usual contemporary art gallery, in my view. Um, so, <clears throat> up the stairs we go. This is my little office ahead. Um, and we'll come back to that a bit later. Um, turn the corner. <laughs> and now we're going to come into the main exhibition space uh, as we turn to the right hand side. I'm going to just, uh, this is the very old flooring which is here, which must be at least a few hundred years old. And we're going to start here, um, which is effectively uh, Carrie's studio. And uh, I met Carrie a few years ago when I did an exhibition um, of her works at a botanical exhibition we put on um, two years ago. And the idea behind that was really to look at uh, all things botanical and to look at uh, many artists who obviously throughout their career um, uh, somehow at some point connect with the botanical world, whether they start with it or develop into it or uh, uh, and we took it right back from uh, BC to classical, through the classical world, and all into and, and all the way to kind of contemporary art. Um, and we showed a few of Carrie's works there, and they looked absolutely fabulous. And since then, in a very nice a traditional uh, uh, development between gallery and artists, we've spoken about it and, and, um, and developed an idea. 
And so when the idea of the exhibition came up, which was um, maybe 12 months ago or something properly, or maybe a bit longer than that, actually, um, I felt that I didn't just want her works up on the wall. Every time I went to her studio, it was full of um, interesting things. And uh, uh, I felt that the things that she surrounded herself with uh, were very informative and told me a lot about her interests. And so we've kind of recreated her studio as the starting point for the exhibition. Uh, and this, uh, uh, this, is, this is it. <laughs> so I'm just gonna move around very slowly. Uh, and we're gonna start at this cabinet, which is right here. Um, and I'm also gonna introduce you to Carrie very quickly, who's, who's, who's here. And um, uh, uh, I'm just gonna put the places over here. <laughs> So this Hello, is Carrie. Carrie. Hello, Carrie. It's lovely to meet you. Thank you so much for welcoming us. <laughs> um, and effectively, this uh, uh, cabinet that you see here was uh, actually at the British Museum. And Carrie very cleverly spotted it uh, and bought it maybe a few months before um, the exhibition uh, uh, came on. Uh, it's, it's actually for storing butterflies. Um, and she's using it as a kind of a, a system to store her, her sort of sketches, her uh, ceramic sketches. Um, and so I thought it would be a nice place to start. Yes, let's go and snoop. <laughs> so these are um, little uh, tryouts that she does, little samples. Yes, little studies. So before I start making anything big, I just started uh, modeling uh, some plants um, just to sort of as a warm up sort of exercise. I feel like they're very much um, uh, like, let's say uh, for a painter, they might be a series of preparatory drawings. It's the equivalent of that. Right. Almost like sketches. Yes, exactly. Sketches. Right. Um, so I thought that's a very nice kind of introduction, um, just to kind of give you a taste of things. And then I'm going to move slowly around the kind of gallery of the sort of uh, studio wall, if that's okay. Yes, please. So here are some of her, she makes um, more objects. Uh, uh, obviously, many of the pieces you're going to see in the exhibition are actually up on the wall. But there are also, this is an interesting uh, starting point, because it points out where Carrie uh, uh, comes from. She comes from Arita which is in the south of Japan, this beautiful island called Kyushu, which is actually very close to Korea. And um, Arita is very famous for ceramics and her family uh, uh, were in that world of trading ceramics. And she grew up in that tradition, learning how to uh, uh, work with clay. But the most important thing in that area, as many of you will know, is tableware and functional bowls and uh, cups and, and these kind of things. Uh, and it was only after Carrie came to the UK and studied with the Royal College that she saw in her mind the potential of working in lots of different areas of play and opening it up beyond tableware. So in a way, these are the two elements combined. The first is the sort of the bowl she makes very beautifully and elegantly. And the second are these plants, which is her latest uh, uh, work, which she's able to put in them. Is it, is it one piece or is it two pieces and the plant? They move around a little bit in the, um, in the, in the pot. You can kind of move them around. Right. Uh, uh, yeah, so it's several pieces. It's delightful. So these are just things that would be sitting on surfaces in her, in her, um, in her studio that I just found so kind of uh, touching. Um, this piece here is a very nice development where she's taken one of the uh, butterfly drawers uh, and put another back to it and then placed a, a, one of her works inside. Um, and it has a kind of crossover between obviously a kind of contemporary work of ceramics, but it also has a very much a sense of a specimen or a, something you'd find obviously in sort of the 19th century or 18th century kind of uh, cabinets of curiosities. Mm -hmm. It's such a fine work. How do you achieve such fine roots, for example, in the uh, ceramic, that's going to be an interesting uh, explanation to receive from Carrie. Carrie, question is, is how do you get such uh, fine roots and how are these things? Well, it's all done by hand, so I just make each one of the roots uh, by hand and attach them. So just a close observation to the, to the model. 
and uh, and also I have uh, like a background of uh, a, a potter. I have to say uh, I was trained potter, so I combine different techniques, pot pottery techniques, to achieve different uh, results. Right. Yeah, which she explained to me a few times as I asked her the first time I saw her works. I said, how did you transition from tableware to, to, to flowers and things? And she said, well, it was very easy in that I knew how to make certain shapes from, let's say I could adapt how I would move the clay when I was making a, a handle on a teapot and adapt that uh, uh, understanding of, of the movements of the clay and apply it to, to a different form. Right. Um, so again, I feel like it's like she learned the techniques and then was able to apply it to different, to different things. This is a rather well, beautiful peony. <laughs> um, and then, so we've got different sort of uh, sketches and different uh, objects around. Um, a few years ago, Carol was very much focusing on still lives. Um, so this is one of a, a lemon and, and uh, a, a jug, egg. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's a cabinet, of, and, and since then she's moved in, into kind of more botanical works. Right. Uh, um, Kari, have you been using the, uh, the London Museum to uh, develop her work? Is that a place where you, um, you find inspiration, you go and work there? Yes, I do go to v &A and a uh, and there's another local little museum called Honeyman's. I often visit and get inspiration from the collection. Yes. Right. Um, so I'm now going to take you over uh, uh, to, let's say, some bigger specimens. Um, and this is a rather wonderful wall of uh, tulips and a hyacinth in the centre. Um, for me, um, the colour doesn't come out very well here, but it reminds me a little bit of a, an old master painting, like one of those ones the Dutch did on copper. Um, Again, she's focusing on these insects and, and, and uh, flowers. And Carol, I remember you saying that one of your main ideas was to try and capture a moment in, in the life of a, of, a, of a flower or a plant. Is that, is that right? Yes. So they, I think that the clay has the ability of capturing the moment. So in a way, stopping the clock and uh, preserving uh, object in time. So I choose... Um, botanical like plant and also insect uh, which has the life so that you get a strong sense of the, the their moment being preserved. Mm -hmm. But so the, when you uh, when you are modeling oh that's beautiful we see all the detail there. Um, when you are modeling the um, the tulip for example it has to be totally fresh yes. and uh, so then you have a limited amount of time to do that before exactly. it gets, yeah? Yes, so I always have the, the actual plant or flower in front of me uh, to observe. So um, yes, the, the, the tulips flowering period is a few weeks and all the plant has got the, the seasons. So I have to capture that moment to, to model them. So if I miss one plant season, then I have to wait for another year. So right. uh, the time is very limited. Mm -hmm. So you, you kind of have um, each season has a different collection to be able to uh, uh, follow the, uh, the natural cycle. And yes. do you choose a theme throughout the year and you would illustrate that theme with different plants in the season or do you go by absolutely by season? Yes, by seasons, yes. I, um, I just follow nature and um, I have to because uh, that's when the, my models are uh, available. So. Right, right. Um, it's, 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 is, it, um, is this fired or...? Um, yes. yes, it is. So it's been fired to stoneware temperature, so they are stoneware. Right. Mm -hmm. That's it. Who is it? So this is a, a, a bramble, um, and I like it very much because in the, I mean, uh, in the UK, a bramble is very much part of uh, growing up in the UK. It grows everywhere. It's in your local hedgerow, 
and then you go picking blueberries in the, uh, in the season. And I like it because she's not just focusing always on the, she often finds unusual uh, uh, subjects and really kind of looks at them in such detail that I can just, it's not just the portrait of the flower which she's, or plant that she's doing, but for me, I think the thing that's quite successful or relatively extraordinary is she gets the feel of the, of the plant. Uh, uh, and that is um, something very unusual in my view. Mm -hmm. um, so this is the, uh, the first of a, of a bigger piece, obviously. It's difficult to give you the scale, but these are quite big walls. Uh, um, so, and, and they can be arranged in different formations. Um, and um, it's one of the pieces, one of my favorites, if I might say so. <laughs> how, many, how many pieces have you got there? Good question. <laughs> We're counting. Maybe 10 big pieces. 10 large works, um, I'd say. So this work is the, this is probably one of the largest ones and um, is the only one which combines different plants and flowers. Um, and this was a commission completed maybe uh, a year ago. Um, and it's based specifically on someone's garden in Oxfordshire in, is it in June or so, yeah. Um, and so it has a very personal connection. And um, I just love it. I think the, the composition is, 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 is wonderful. And as I take you in, if you don't mind, I'll take you to some of the details. So what's this carrier? I can't remember. I never remember the name of this. This is Nastatsum. And it goes up to Daisy and some poppy and foxgrass, which has got a lot of seed head, and then move to the hollyhock, which is the tallest. And because it's it was um, also seeding, so the, the flower um, start opening from the bottom of the plant and then it goes up so at the bottom you've got all these seed heads and then at the top you have buds again. I'm not sure if my filming's okay but it gives a sense of the kind of composition and the, and the movement. It's fantastic um, it really shows extremely well how do you attach the uh, the pieces to the wall? To the wall, yeah. So the the big pieces are made in sections because um, I have a limited size of my kiln shelves. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna take you a little bit behind, which is the the secrets. Where so uh -huh. so here you can see where there's it looks like one piece, but there's actually two there. Right. But Carrie always brilliantly hides them behind leaves. Yeah, so you can never see it from the front or even really from the side unless you go right around the side. So they are assembled on the wall and I don't know how many pieces all together on this uh, particular uh, work, probably 30 to 40 um, pieces assembled together on the wall. And how are they attached to the wall? So the each section has got a, a wire loop at the at the uh, on the back and um, on the wall I put tiny nails and uh, so the work is uh, hung from, oh, yes. from the, the nails. I mean it's very subtle. Yeah it's wonderful. And, and you know one of the things that I also that Carrie mentioned that I, I wouldn't have thought of because I you know my relationship with material is not the same is that effectively she's making these works flat but then she has to consider how they're going to look when they're uh, vertical. And, and also there's the weight of it and how, if it can support its own weight, for example. Right. Carrie, do you ever use color or is the, uh, the, the creamy natural color of the clay yeah. or medium? This is the, the natural color of the clay. And at one point I decided not to use any color or any glaze over. So which I often thought that it just distract you from looking at the forms. And also what I'm trying to do is, uh, this is a little bit like taking a photograph of a scenery. Um, so, because I'm trying to preserve um, the, the, the moment. So it's a little bit like monochrome picture. So you don't uh, get distracted by colors or the shininess of the, the glaze. Mm -hmm. So I don't use the color anymore. 
Okay, so I'm just going to do a little a turnaround because it gives you it'll give you the sense of the space in the gallery, and we'll walk into the other uh, other part of the um, uh, of the of the gallery as well. Can we see what's on the desk? Yes, of course we can. Here you are. So presumably those are little work in progress and herbariums and notes. That's it, exactly. Do you go and um, um, collect things, pick up things on your walks, Kauri? Do you, I can see some shells here, or how do you, where do you find the plants? Do you go to flower market? Yes, flower market. I love antique market and um, just pick, collecting stuff. Um, so yes, I constantly do that. So and those uh, objects inspire me. Right. Okay. We were talking uh, with an artist not so long ago about uh, mudlarking and how she oh, yes. picks things up in the river and uses it. Um, she makes jewelry and she uses it as inspiration and incorporates it in her jewelry. So this. This habit of artists to collecting things as they go along. <laughs> yes, yes. I think they they always have like stories, and uh, I love a uh, object with um, with uh, story and memory attached. Right. Okay, so we're going into the, the sort of front room now, um, and this has an absolutely wonderful. Uh, light to it. I'm just going to take you very quickly just because it's a relatively warm, sorry, English evening. We can actually look out. What a view! And there are often, in fact, um, costume dramas filmed on the square, as you can, you can see why. So there are people wearing top hats with horses and carriages and, and so on and so forth. Yes, totally imagine it. <laughs> um, yeah, and it's just one of the last standing uh, 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 neoclassical squares in London. It just has a very nice proportions with a, having a square, a circle in the, in the center around a square. Anyway, that's uh, the view out the window. And now I'll just bring you back in and maybe we can just look, uh, we can start by looking at this uh, Cardoon, which is one of my favorites. Um, it's again, a big word, sort of definitely well over a meter. Um, I don't know what Karen, what you might be able to say about this, but I, I think it's a marvelous work, very sculptural. Um, it comes off the wall, uh, uh, you know, very thick off the wall. Uh, these leaves must be the biggest leaves that I can make because that's the size of my kiln shelf. Right. How long would it take you to make a piece like that, Carrie? A uh, few months, I would say, yes. And the, the, the size that you choose to go for is influenced by the location that you have in mind to put it in, I guess not, or is it is it a moment where you think that, you know, or that plant calls for a um, big scale? What influences your choice in the, the size of the piece? Uh, the size of the piece is they are more or less life size, but I, I make them slightly bigger than the, the actual um, life size because uh, the, if I make it exactly the life size object, then it will look appear to be smaller than the, the actual thing. So I always and also clay shrinks. So when I'm making um, object in clay, I make uh, object about twenty percent bigger, and then it will shrink ten percent. And so I ended up having ten percent bigger than the life size plant and object. If that makes sense. And uh, this card, and I have it in my garden, and I always want to uh, make it because it's such a, a big and uh, sort of architectural plant. So it's a challenge, but uh, I'm very happy with the how it uh, came out. Uh, Tristan, I assume that you have a catalog of the exhibit that we'll be able to share. 
No, I mean, yes, we definitely, we have a, a digital one, yes. And then eventually, I think, hopefully we'll make a, um, a little booklet about the exhibition and uh, photograph of installation shots and, and so on and so forth. But yes, of course, okay. absolutely. Um, Carrie, um, I'm interested to, uh, to know, I mean, you grew up in Japan where presumably the vegetation is very different. Um, yes. Because you make from live plants, I assume that you can't make plants from Japan in your uh, London studio. Do you miss the flowers and the plants from Japan? And, and would you I like think Yes, I think originally that was what I was missing. And uh, so uh, about 20 years ago, I wasn't into gardening or growing any plants. And then I didn't realize that how much I'm missing it. And then suddenly that kicks in and I kicked in and then I started growing things in pots. And then eventually I had my own garden. So it slowly developed inside me. So um, yes, in the beginning I was like, uh, trying to create the moss garden, but realized that that's not possible to, to do in, in the climate in London. So I adapted the sort of more like an English garden for right. myself. And when you go, do you take the opportunity to make uh, Japanese vegetation, Japanese flowers? The, yes, sometimes I, yes, I try. I tried like a, uh, a little bit of bonsai at one point and uh, try to grow some Japanese uh, alpine plants and wild plants. I, I do have some of those as well. Right. So I'm just walking you towards one of the uh, bigger works in the exhibition, above the fireplace. I think actually I'm going to let Carrie talk about this one as well because it's one that she's very proud of. Uh, and quite rightly, it's very, very skillful. Uh, it's also not, not a, a, a plant that I knew about or would, would recognize. <laughs> so yes, this one is called Meliantus major. Uh, the common name is the honeybush. And uh, again, I have this plant in my garden and always um, fascinated by the, the form and how sort of, um, yes, architectural the, the plant is. So it was a challenge, but I wanted to make it for this exhibition, and I'm very pleased. The, the, the most difficult, uh, uh, technically difficult uh, part was this jagged edge leaves, but I uh, somehow managed to find a way to, to achieve that. Right, it's amazing. I mean, they, they, um, the quiet elegance of these pieces is, uh, is remarkable. Thank you. <laughs> Well, I'm very glad you, you can pick up on that on the screens. It's exactly that. And quite a few people who come to the exhibition, always um, you start noticing what people say, and, and they all feel there's a sort of quiet calm when it comes out from them, which is very nice. Mm -hmm. um, and then maybe I'll just quickly also show you this um, magnolia, which I think is also absolutely wonderful. And also very sculptural. Uh, Ah. The magnolias are just coming into bloom in Canada, so this is this is marvelous. <laughs> um, well, here, I've been told that they've just finished. My Carrie keeps me informed about what's possible and what's not, and apparently they've just finished here. <laughs> so I take Tristan that you're not a gardener. <laughs> well, I am a little bit of a gardener. I've got a bit of gardening in my family, but I just you know I don't know the names for things or when these come out, so I'm learning a lot. Uh, so, um, no, I'm not a gardener, but definitely I, I feel like I've got potential, even if I say so myself. Um, and there's a couple of other just really smaller details. I just wanted to show you this wonderful piece. It's wonderful. Thanks. You know, to be able to do that, and I love the way the weight of it hangs down. It's so successful, that. Yeah. In clay. Carrie, when your pieces are in the kiln, do you support them so they don't um, rest and fall flat? How, what do you support them with? Uh, I have to support them with the same clay so that the shrinkage is the same, so uh, they can move in the kiln um, sort of together. So I support, uh, I have to support a lot uh, of um, the plants and leaves. 
from the from the from above from above no, from mm. from the Venice. Right. It's a very good question, um, and um, you know the idea of it shrinking because so much water is lost, obviously when it's, it's burnt in the kiln. The, 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 the obviously the proportions change, and to be able to control that or understand how that will work, you know, I, I feel is one of her great skills. Mm -hmm. Tristan, we have to compliment you on the um, uh, the feel and, and the background on the walls. Did you create that atmosphere in the room specifically with the, uh, I guess it's almost like rag, uh, rag painting for the exhibit or is it the permanent look of your exhibit? Of well, your thank you very, very much for that, but I cannot take credit for it. It was, we, we very much wanted to choose a color um, which, White also works very well because they're a cream color, you can see. Uh, but um, we wanted something which would bring out, uh, uh, you know, the, the relief a little bit more without being too sort of gallery gray about it. And it was actually Carrie who found this wonderful kind of lime wash, uh, which we've applied in a, a few layers and it, it works really well. It's fabulous, fabulous. Uh, and now I'm gonna just turn around. Uh, and show you one of the, the sort of biggest piece, which I, I'm rather in love with, which is this absolutely wonderful wall of uh, bearded irises, which oh, Harry's worked on furiously for the last year. Uh, maybe you can go into that. Yeah. And this is very much inspired, but I'll let Harry tell you more about it. But, just as a basic, uh, uh, to give you an idea, they're full scale, so they're, you know, about almost a metre high, um, and very much based on uh, that famous uh, screen in the Nezu Museum in Tokyo, which in true Japanese fashion is only brought out once a year when the, when the um, irises are in blue. Uh, and um, I just think it's a, it's a fantastic, uh, I mean, it, I suppose you call it an installation. Uh, Astonishing. Um, and again, Carrie had trouble because the season ended. Um, and so therefore she hadn't quite finished or got enough ready in time. Uh, yeah, you were, you were quite lucky. Yes, yeah. and I had one pot of um, iris which miraculously formed a bud and then flowered. So I can carry on modeling this single um, iris over and over again from different angle and then from the bat to to finish the flowering um yes so uh, without that single iris i couldn't have made this big installation very happy with that um, just move a bit closer to show some of the details so do you sell the work, is that one piece that one would buy or could you buy two or three irises and... and well, well, it's a very good question. We, when we looked at the size of it, I was a bit kind of uh, nervous that um, it would be very difficult to find someone with a, um, you know, with, with a scale, uh, uh, it's about five meters. Um, so we, we split it up and we said that uh, into five units. We, but we said that if anyone came along and wanted the whole piece, then they could have it because that's really what it was conceived as. And I'm very happy to say that someone did. Uh, um, and so they bought it as a, a single piece and it's going to go in a large room in, in Italy somewhere. I'm very, I'm very pleased about that. Uh, this is so exciting. Congratulations. I mean, this is really tremendous. Uh, congratulations. Um, and I don't know why bearded irises seem to be a thing. Harry, uh, uh, a lot of people seem to like that variety more than anything else. Why did, why did you choose that variety, for example? Um, it was different from the, this Japanese uh, screen. I think the, the one the, the, he painted, the Korean Ogata, was the, uh, the, the other type, which is a bulb plant. But uh, I saw this is for the London show and uh, for, for, for this exhibition, I saw the, the bearded iris, which is more common in this country, is uh, a suitable object. Yeah. Marvellous. Maybe I'll turn, turn around and you can have a, a look at the media artist properly again. <laughs> um, 
Carrie, how um, how durable are the uh, the pieces? I guess they're quite fragile, can be easily chipped, and they have to be handled with great uh, great care. Yes, uh, but they are stoneware, so they are fired to a stoneware temperature, which is like 12, 50 degrees. So they are as strong as uh, normal tableware. So they are not uh, as fragile as they might may appear. And um, but usually for these wall pieces, I install personally myself. So um, and once they are up on the wall, as long as you don't bash them, uh, they are very safe. Right, yeah, and I suppose that the uh, the way to dust them would be with uh, with a, a canister of compressed air, and and yes, just blow air yes, on them. Yes, that's the best uh, <laughs> best way of cleaning it. So you just spray the uh, the the air into the into the um, right. Oh, it's exquisite! What a privilege to see to see your work and uh, and to see what are you working on at the moment? What's the next? Uh, the next project or are you exhausted and you need to recover from such a momentous uh, production a momentous momentous work yes no I, I am very itching to go back to my studio and start capturing all these spring flowers that emerging right at the moment so before they finish i want to capture them so my next project is whichever the plant comes back available and for me Right. So are you in the studio and you work and work and work and work for, for days and weeks and 24 seven, you don't come out. I can Im I'm almost imagining you with that, that fever of creation racing against time until racing against the flowers wilting. Yes, I think I often do that, like give up the weekend when the, the flowers are, are having that moment. And uh, I stay in the winter time, I can relax a little bit and uh, maybe use time for more sort of inspiration and uh, research and uh, doing some sketches and stuff like that. Right, that's amazing. Fabulous. Well, I, I think that gives you a good sense of, uh, of the exhibition. Is there any, anything else you'd like me to? Uh, uh, point the selfie stick in that general direction or do you have any questions or anything? Uh, I think we went through, uh, through all the questions that have been uh, posted in the chat box that uh, at the moment there are no more questions. Maybe we can uh, discover your your gallery and uh, have a little tour around maybe? Yeah, I'm, I'm very happy to give you a, a little tour. Uh, just please uh, know this is very much behind the scenes and it'll be, uh, uh, it's not as um, elegant as this front row. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the gallery is open live, but by appointment only, is that correct? Yeah, I mean, at the moment it's, it's, it's because of the general situation, it's, it's by appointment, but, but you know, um, if there's no one in, in the gallery rooms when someone knocks on the door, then they're, they're welcome, but they can just wait uh, in, in Fitzroy Square for five minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Actually, this is a nice sort of beginning into, this is, uh, for example, uh, um, an artist who was part of the same botanical exhibition I was talking about, where Carrie and I first began working together. And she's called Dominique Lacloche. Um, and these are giant gunnery leaves, which she uh, cultivates herself and then treats with light sensitive uh, uh, materials and then sort of places and fixes uh, uh, images around where the gunnera grows. It's the biggest leaf in the world. I'm sure plenty of you know it. Um, and so she turns this leaf, it's a real leaf, into a giant photograph, which I think they're rather amazing. That's a so that, really huge leaf. Yeah, it's absolutely huge. And this is not a big one. There are ones that are double, triple the size. So. Anyway, that's one artist, for example, that I work with, and uh, that's developed since the same time where I did the botanical exhibition with, with, um, with Carrie. Anyway, I'll, I'll take us into our <coughs> back room. Tristan, how do you uh, how do you select the artists that you represent that you work with? What do you have a process, or is it coup de cœur, or uh, you yeah, technology? I mean, it's it's part. Um, yeah, could curve is definitely part of the process, uh, uh, but it's also luck, you know, uh, and as you 
build your maybe network or a bit of a reputation. Uh, people come to you with, with ideas and suggestions. Um, and most of the time uh, in the past, I've always, my policy was always, if I was invited to go to a studio by an artist or by a collector or someone, I would just always go. I felt a little bit, it's about a bit like dating, that very quickly you'd tell uh, that you were suited to each other or not. Uh, uh, but it didn't matter. I learned through that. And um, you can pick up a lot, of, obviously, at an artist's studio. And then, you know, books, uh, other artists would recommend me going to see other studios. And, and really, it's a kind of, um, once I fixed on, on an exhibition of any kind, um, really, that's what uh, would cement the whole process is the experience that you go through. And if you enjoy it, then you start, um, you know, you start working together. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a few more of Carrie's, just, uh, this is our sort of ante room. And actually continuing on the theme of, it's quite a nice link in, uh, um, is my next little exhibition, uh, which is in the, will be in the back room, is this pot here. And this uh, very nice vase uh, is by an artist called Peter Schlesinger. Um, and Peter, uh, in fact, is well, well known, uh, partly because uh, he was David Hockney's boyfriend for many years. Um, and was also an artist. They met when Hockney was teaching in, in I think, in Cow Arts in Los Angeles. And um, Peter's been a ceramicist for about 20 years or so. He's never had a show in London. And I've, I've got the beginnings of a kind of an exhibition. I, I was meant to do it before the lockdown, um, but we, we haven't been able to do it because obviously of everything that went on. So I have a group of about 10 ceramics um, here, and I'm gonna do a little exhibition in the back. Um, mm -hmm. This little nude here is by a, a, a sculptor called Michael Cooper. He's an Irish sculptor who lives just outside of London. He's actually a, a, a family friend. And I just, sort of, from time to time, he, he will sculpt me a, um, a marble nude from, he loves um, working with Carrara or Kilkenny marbles. Uh, these, and um, I love having them around. I just think they're very nice objects and they sort of sit very nicely on ledges and tables and things like that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, coming into my office now, which is on the left hand side, uh, uh, which is the team, which is uh, Ariana and Nicole. Um, I just wanted to show you this because this was definitely part of my journey. Uh, this little section here, I'm sorry it's so badly lit. But um, when I first went to Japan, I had the luck of going down to Kyushu where, where I met these uh, potters. And their story, which is absolutely wonderful, is that. Um, in around 1600, I think it was, uh, there was a Japanese, it's very, very, Kyushu, uh, that Southern Island, as I said before, is very, very close to Japan, um, uh, to, to Korea, sorry. You, I think you can effectively swim across. It's like the relationship between France and England in terms of how close they are. And the, uh, the, the ceramicists in that time were very uh, sought after um, by the Japanese. And there was a, uh, a big, um, warlord or, or um, conqueror who went over to, to um, Korea uh, with an army and eventually was, was beaten back. But on the way back, he uh, basically uh, kidnapped effectively a group of ceramicists and brought them back. And these guys, I met the 13th, 14th and 15th generations. Um, and they're very well known in Japan, uh, very little known outside, but they just made these absolutely wonderful they're very earthy glazes. They work in a traditional kilns with sort of wood-fired kilns. And that was somehow, I bought a group of them. Um, and I had them around in my flat and, and, and so on and so forth. And just by living around them, I just sort of started sort of tuning into ceramics. And I feel, feel that although they're very modest and very simple, uh, I absolutely love them. And I feel that they're really the, the gateway into my sort of interest in, in, in ceramics more generally. Um. And that's the marvelous thing about, um, about objects, craft objects, um, that they, they really enrich your daily life and they feed your soul. Um, even the simplest objects, often the simplest objects have more meaning and, and more power almost than more convoluted and highly decorative objects. I, I completely agree. But I didn't know that until I just sort of stumbled across it. And these very simple things give me enormous, enormous pleasure. Yes, exactly. Um, 
So, and here, for example, is something I like very much, which is a, a, a flower vase on the right hand side. And it's just something which you would, um, it's got a hole in the, in, in the back. I'm not sure I can reach over with a selfie stick, but you would just put a nail in the wall and then put a flower in it. And it's just sort of simple. And I love these sort of running glazes and things. So, um, and what else can I show you? I mean, this is more of my sort of, uh, it's sort of more African uh, influence. When I first started, I uh, organized an exhibition of a couple of Malian photographers, Malik Sidi Bey and Sadu Keita, um, who have big followings now. And again, I had a rather relatively recent and interesting experience where I went to Senegal, uh, which is the same kind of tribal area as Mali. And I came across these absolutely wonderful uh, glass paintings, painted in the 80s by this, this character. I just thought they were absolutely wonderful. And so I bought a group of them and I planned to do an exhibition of them. Um, it's reverse glass painting, which is a very complicated thing to do. So you have to do everything in reverse. Uh, uh, and after I'd sort of um, lived around them again, I came back, I noticed the similarity with these other uh, Sadie Keita uh, photographs. I'm sorry the reflection's so bad, but one of the things is, is, is the status is shown by the positions of your hands will show if you're married or not, or if the portrait is for a specific uh, reason. And also the jewellery and how it's worn is so similar. And I realise it's basically the same thing, which is one's a painting, uh, and then one's a photograph. So that was a very nice kind of coincidence. Um, and then moving on quite sort of swiftly, this is an exhibition I did with a brilliant uh, uh, draftsman who's got a big uh, reputation in, more in France. It's called Pierre Latin. Mm -hmm. And he designed uh, many front covers of the New Yorker and things like that. He actually was a great collector himself. Um, and uh, he always uh, draws in this kind of cross-hatch style. They're always very, actually very quiet, his drawings. Um, and I did an exhibition with him where um, we put the contents <laughs> of his Paris apartment uh, in the gallery, because it, as you saw just now, it's quite domestic. There's fireplaces and things. So we put sofas in and we, we, um, he drew many of his favorite objects. So on the walls, we had his drawings of his objects. And in, uh, in the rooms, we had the objects themselves. Oh, that's exquisite. But you have, uh, am I right in thinking that you have some French influence uh, yourself, isn't it? I, I do, I'm half French. My mother's French. And so, and I've spent uh, a long time, I mean, I often go to France and, and, and I love France, I think, but I just grew up more in England. Yeah. Right. Um, well, an amazing collection there and the variety is, is it's very nice fantastic. thank you thank you and then very quickly you know i just i'll show you just here are three more of peter's uh, large vases the thing i really like about him is that he's they're all incredibly different the lighting in here is terrible and i apologize for that but i somehow i like how different they are but you can sort of sense that they're him uh, as well mm -hmm. um and behind uh, is an artist called Carolina Mazzolari, who I work with, who works in, in textile. Uh, um, and she's done a series of new, uh, they're called flags. They're often, uh, in her mind, somehow uh, uh, descriptions of different emotional states, um, but uh, and more conceptual uh, than, let's say, the ceramics I have around. But I, I love them, and they have a very nice sort of, um, again, crafty feel. Can um, we see a bigger piece of ah yes? I wanted to see that piece. I think it's absolutely astonishing. Her technique and her embroidery um, is remarkable. Can you tell us a little bit about her? Yeah, so so you know, Carolina studied textile design. Um, you know, she's in her late thirties or so, and was at different sort of uh, very contemporary art schools, and uh, so she's got this sort of mix of. Uh, uh, you know, the more traditional techniques she's using where she loves, uh, 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 you know, the stitching, which she knows how to do is a herringbone stitch. It takes a long time. Uh, but at the same time, she's sort of trying to use it in a very kind of contemporary way. So this piece is called Island. And again, it's, it started from a series uh, she, she began called Emotional Fields, which was because she was reading a lot about uh, psychology and, and these ideas around emotional maps. Um, and these for her are, are different uh, emotional states really. Um, 
So uh, these uh, flags are much simpler in their conception somehow. This is another piece uh, called stairs. Um, and um, look at that stitch work. But she often uses this gray stitching, which reflects the light very well. Mm. Again, I'm sorry about the lighting in here, but it's definitely sort of the back room, as it were. <laughs> well, we're very privileged to go behind the scenes. You know, we uh, we love snooping around and uh, going <laughs> where other people can't go. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're quite right. And then the last thing I'll show you, we're moving still in ceramics and things, is one of my moon jars. I did an exhibition of moon jars a little while ago. Um, and for, for those of you who don't know what a moon jar is, it, there's only two things you need to know. One is it's uh, from Korea. And the other thing is, is that it's made in two halves. And so while still slightly wet, the two halves are put together and being very kind of uh, far Eastern in their kind of views, it's the imperfections and the different things that, you, that come out of it not being a perfect circular shape, which is the thing that most interests people about them.